Hey everyone, my name is AJ. Um, I just wanted to take you through a few of the things that goes into the uh, end process of making a sword. Um, so I've already got my blade made, and here it is. It's an Oakshot Type 18B. Okay, it's a nice slender blade, uh, probably more thrusting oriented than cutting oriented. Um, it's also nice and shiny and polished and everything. And it's also fully heat treated, so that means that I can do stuff like that without having to worry about it breaking or bending, for that matter. Um, so I have my blade. I also have my guard, which is a style 12. I'd call it a style 12. It's um, the same style that uh, it's the same general look that cat's boggers use. Which, if you don't know what those are, those are neat little sidearms. Go ahead and look them up. So. It's also fitted on, so I got my guard and my blade right here, okay? Um, now, the part that I'm really going to be focusing on is something called the pommel, which um, a lot of you, I'm sure, know this, but the pommel is that little counterweight at the end of the sword, like this little guy, okay? Now, the purpose of a pommel is, um, as everyone, or most people know, it's mainly as a counterweight, like I said. So for here right now, the point of balance is right about here, right? So that's without the pommel. There's the point of balance. Making sure I don't drop it. There we go. So there's the point of balance without the pommel. And um, say I take a piece of modeling clay, um, put it onto the end here, and now the point of balance is about there. Okay, so just from that little piece of clay, it moved a good inch forward or so. So, um, <clears throat> that's one of the things that I like to do really, is uh, using modeling clay and a scale to measure out how much weight I need to be there for the pommel itself. Because otherwise I'm going to be grinding this thing down from a piece of stock that's about this big around um, and checking it every five seconds and going through these extensive checks to make sure that I didn't remove too much weight and everything is still where I want it to be. Okay, The clay allows me to do that extremely fast and then I just take the piece of clay that I'm happy with, weigh it quick, and that's how much the pommel has to weigh. So um, that's something that I highly recommend doing to any swordsmith, um, just because it saves you hours, like absolutely hours. And you can get every, you can fine tune it um, to get it exactly where you want everything to be. Okay, and by everything, I don't just mean the point of balance. Okay, everybody seems obsessed with this idea of, you know, the point of balance, point of balance, but <clears throat> it's actually not as important as everyone makes it out to be. Okay. So for most uh, most inexpensive uh, production swords like uh, windless steel craft stuff like that, um, the taper on the sword is not perfect. It's not even generally usually it's not even good. Okay, so when you have a point of balance that's about three inches out, you know you get used to that and you think. Oh, okay, three inches or so, it's going to be a really quick, lively sword because the point of balance is going to be the point at which the sword kind of rotates around in your hand, okay? Or it's going to want to, all right? So if you have the point of balance right at where the guard is going to be, right here, then it's going to feel like it wants to rotate at the guard, which means that there's going to be, it's, it's going to feel like the blade is absolutely weightless because, in effect, it is. If you have a pommel like, say, this, you yeah, this really oversized piece here, if you have something like that, um, it's going to put the point of balance right at the cross, okay, and the blade is going to feel like there's nothing there. It's going to want to turn on a dime, um, but it's also going to mean that it's not going to have any cutting power because the blade, the full weight of the blade is basically being countered back here. So it's not going to have as much force behind it, it's not going to have as much, I guess, or no, it's, it's going to have the same momentum, but it's, it's not going to have the same force. 
So uh, that's one of the things that you have to look for with a pommel is something that's close enough to the hand that um, it's still going to be really responsive, yet far enough from the hand that it's going to still uh, let the blade cut to its full potential. Okay, and one of the ways to do this is um, by profiling and tapering the blade in different ways. So you have here the thickness of the sword. Okay, so it starts out this thick and it tapers to here, and that's called distal taper. Okay, that's the taper in thickness. Then you have the taper here, where it starts out this wide and goes to here. Okay, and that's called profile taper. Okay, so those two are two ways of uh, distributing the mass in the most effective way possible. Okay, so if you have a blade with a lot of profile taper and a lot of distal taper, um, like this one has a lot of profile taper, the distal taper is not too much, um, but it's still there. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, if you have a blade like that, you can actually have the point of balance farther out, because there isn't going to be as much mass here. So even though the point of balance is here, it's going to feel like there's nothing at the tip at all, right? So it's actually going to still feel really, really responsive, which is part of the reason why um, when people look at like a windless steel craft sword or something, you know, you see a point of balance that's three inches out, you're like, oh, that's got to be really fast. And then you look at like the higher end swords, like an Albion or an Atrium or something, and you see the point of balance is like six inches out, and it's, you know, you think to yourself, like, why would, why would that be beneficial? And why does that still feel lively? And that's part of the reason, uh, actually, that's mainly the reason, is because of how the blade is profiled and how it's all tapered, um, how the mass distribution is, and how effective it is. So, um, that's part of the thing with the pommel, and that's the balance, okay? So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the waves that are going on in the blade, okay? So by waves, uh, the first one is called the uh, center of percussion, okay? So if I take this blade and I hold it right by where the tang like, or well, right by where the guard would be, right? And I hit it at the end of the tang, the whole blade is going to like act as a wave, okay? And I think you can see that pretty well on the video. So the whole thing is going to act as a wave, and there's going to be a node in there, a spot that doesn't move, okay? And that spot is right here. So let me just go ahead and mark that real quick. So that's where the center of percussion is, all right? And for all of you baseball people, um, that's the exact same thing as the center of percussion on a baseball bat. It's the point of no vibration. It's the sweet spot on the sword, on the bat, whatever. Um, that's a spot that if you hit something with it, it's going to go the farthest. It's going to do the maximum damage. Okay, so that is the sweet spot. Now, let's see what happens when I add... Um, Actually, yeah, I'll just use this. So let's see what happens when I add a lot of weight. And here I've got this, and now I hit it, and the center of percussion is right here. Okay? So, by adding weight onto the end of the tang, I've moved the center of percussion closer to the hand. Also, by adding weight onto the end of the tang, in the form of a pommel, I move the point of balance closer to the hand. So both of these things move closer to the hand. Um, and what does that mean for the center of percussion? Well, the center of percussion is really more of a preference thing. It means that you know if it's right if it's right out here, it means you can afford to be a little bit farther from the opponent and still deal maximum damage. If it's right here, you're going to have to be a little bit closer. Um, again, it's really more of a preference thing than necessarily a performance thing. Um, so that's that, um, but there's still one more kind of wave that um, kind of blew my mind when I first saw it, because so many people don't pay any attention to it. Most, most swordsmen don't pay any attention to this at all, um, and most swordsmiths, or maybe not most, but a lot of them uh, don't really pay much attention to it either, because everyone's focused on the balance, um, but again, and depending on the sword, the point of balance is not the most important part, okay? The, 
point of balance can be countered by you know, a well-profiled and well-tapered blade, okay? <clears throat> so it can be kind of, um, uh, you, can, you can almost replace it with that. Um, but there is one thing that you can't replace with anything, and that for a thrusting sword, this is the most important part, okay? And that is something called the forward pivot point. So, if I take my blade and I hold it right by where the tang is, and I'm going to hold it up like this, and I'm going to start moving my hand back and forth, okay? Now, the blade is going to be doing this kind of thing, right? Where there's going to be a spot that doesn't move, okay? So kind of like the center of percussion where, you know, there's a spot that doesn't move on here. Now there's a spot that basically stays static as I'm moving the blade, okay? And so that is called the forward pivot point. Now, what does that mean, um, or what does that do? That's the spot that the blade is going to rotate around when you're going from, say, one guard to another, or when you're thrusting or something. Um, every, every swordsman that picks up a sword for the first time, or this is one of the first things that they always do, myself included, and this is even when I didn't know what it was that I was testing, but one of the things that we always do is go from a lower hand position to a higher hand position, okay? And so what we're doing in that, kind of subconsciously, is testing how the tip moves, okay? Now, on this blade, because the center of, or the forward pivot point is right about here, so it's going to be, the blade's going to be rotating about that point, so you can see how much the tip is moving in this, right? And that means when I go to thrust, the tip isn't going to stay right on target. Um, so, uh, how can I move this forward pivot point towards the tip? Because if I get it right at the tip, it means that no matter what I do, as long as the tip is more or less um, pointing at the same spot, it's going to be completely stationary. So it's always going to stay on target, and even in the middle of a thrust, it's going to stay on target. The swordsman almost doesn't have to do anything to keep the point exactly where they want it, which is a huge benefit. Um, so, and this is mainly, this is one of the huge things with using uh, clay because that means that I can take the scale, weigh it, right, and um, just kind of play around with how it affects this aspect of it, which on this sword, it's more of a thrusting sword than a cutting sword. So what I really designed this one in mind with was the pivot point. So it was important on this. So um, here I have the blade and the guard, and the pivot point, actually I'm going to take the guard off. It's a little bit annoying to do this with it on. So the pivot point right now is here. Okay? So let me go ahead and mark that really quick. <clears throat> so there's the pivot point. Alright? Now, what happens when I add a little bit of weight? Um, actually, no, that's not going to be enough. What happens if I add this much weight? It's almost right at the tip, okay? So, um, if I added a little bit more weight, it would be right at the tip, um, which I did. Uh, lucky for you guys, so you can see what I'm talking about. But by adding weight onto the end, I moved the forward pivot point closer to the tip. And this is the part that really kind of blew my mind. Uh, when I first heard about this, or when I was first really exposed to this, um, if you put way too much weight on, it actually moves the forward pivot point to a spot that doesn't exist. Okay? So, if I take this, I start moving it back and forth, you can see how the whole blade is moving. There's no longer that node there. So it's just moving because the forward pivot point is actually somewhere probably around here, which means that the sword is rotating about a point that doesn't exist on the sword, okay? And that part was crazy to me, like, 
that it's actually behaving like it was longer. Um, that, or that it's behaving like it was longer than it actually was. Okay. So, um, how does this affect the like kind of going from guard to guard? Uh, so if I add a lot of weight onto here, and I go from a lower hand position to a higher hand position, you can see how much the tip is still moving, because it's still, it's acting as if it were this long, and if it were this long, it would be rotating right around that point, okay? But as it turns out, it's not, so the tip is pretty erratic, alright? Same thing with when you have no weight. Okay, now you see how much the tip moves in this. If you get just the right amount of weight, okay, and I'm going to put the guard on for this one. If you have just the right amount of weight, like in this guy, that means that it's going to be right about at the tip. So, I can do this, and the tip is going to stay basically on target for everything, even a thrust, whatever, and it's not really going to move that much, okay? So that's one of the, that for a thrusting sword, for a thrusting oriented sword, that is the most important thing, is the um, <clears throat> forward pivot point, in my opinion anyway. Um, now, this means that, um, in light of all of this stuff, this means that these three things, which all come from the pommel, they have to be balanced in terms of um, you have to um, you have to use a pommel that's big enough that the point of balance is still where you want it to be. You know, so the blade is still going to be very responsive, okay. And yet you want it to you want it, you still want to have the center of percussion fairly far out on the blade. You know, you don't want it down here or something if you had a huge pommel. Um, I, I don't even know if you could really do that. Like it would take it probably take three pounds of material, um, but uh, so you kind of want that farther out. So you want a smaller pommel with that. You also want a smaller pommel because, as you look at this guy, if you imagine this one way bigger, and you put it on the tang here, the pommel is going to be moving back and forth with the blade as it hits something because of the waves being transferred to it. In some cases with really, really big pommels, it can be extreme enough that the vibrations can shear off the tang at that point. Okay, um, that's, I, I've never experienced this, but in extreme cases it has been known to happen. Um, it's kind of hard to do that, but, um, you know, that's something else to consider. You still want a small pommel so you don't break the tang off, um, or you don't risk it, anyway. So, uh, bigger pommel for the point of balance moving back, smaller pommel for the strength of the tang, smaller pommel for the center of percussion, but bigger pommel for the forward pivot point. So it's a matter of, every sword is a matter of trying to achieve a balance with all of these things and keeping all of them in mind, plus some other stuff that um, is a little bit more complex, but um, that's basically what goes into designing every sword, and that's why you, know, you can spend hours designing it, and then more, even longer, building it. Because the building is the part that really takes a while. The designing is relatively quick compared to it. But still, you know, for, for this blade, I sat around here for you know, a little while trying to put everything together and get it exactly where I wanted it to be. Okay. Um, so again, those are just some of the more basic things um, that goes into the uh, making of a sword, and I'm sure that some of you might want to see this again, so bendy, and it's straight, and that's basically all I have for you today, so um, yeah.